welcome friends to this monthly meeting we have in order to stay on track on our spiritual journeys. I'm sorry I got delayed in another meeting and came late. When I get delayed by 10 minutes, I tell a story. <laughs> when I get more late, I don't know if the story is still valid or not. But I tell you the story anyway. These large corporations here, large retail stores, like Walmart, Walgreens, Dominique's, there are many stores, grocery stores, and other stores here. For some years now, they have started hiring old retired people as greeters on their doors. It has helped them in their business. The greeters are retired. They are not looking for a new job, but to spend a little time outside in the mornings. They come and help the store. And they greet people, welcome to the store, welcome today morning. People are happy, they like it, and the customer base has increased because of this recruitment of greeters. In one of the large stores, they hired a nice man who had retired, but he would come 10 minutes late every day. So the manager of the store said to him that, look, you are such a nice person. Everybody likes you. You smile and greet people. But every day you come 10 minutes late. What would people say in your office where you worked earlier if you came late every day like that? So the man put his head a little down and said they would say, good morning, Admiral, shall we bring your coffee now? <laughs> Justify 10 minutes of my delay. <laughs> How many of you here have come because you are on a journey to your spiritual true home? How many of you have come here to wake up to a reality? Journey people are more. <laughs> Is it really a journey that we make? When we go to sleep and have a dream, this body of ours is lying in bed and sleeping. We are unaware of it when we dream. In the dream, we have a different body, similar to this one. We think it's the same one. In the dream, we feel it's the same body. And we run around different places, go all over. And we think we have gone away somewhere far. Sometimes we even come to know it's a dream. I remember as a child, I had a dream in which I felt this is a dream. My body is sleeping somewhere in the bed. I better rush back to find my body to wake up. So I was trying to run to the house, to go back into the house, into my bedroom, to find where I'm sleeping so I can get back and wake up. When I woke up, I discovered I'd gone nowhere. The dream was not taking place anywhere else except where I was sleeping on the bed. But the experience was, I had to journey back to come back to my wakeful state. Can you imagine this could be really our state even now. That instead of saying we have to make a journey somewhere, we merely have to wake up where we already are. The only way to know that is to wake up. Before that, there's no way to know that we are making a journey or not making a journey. But when we wake up, we discover we were already there. When we talk of levels of consciousness, we are really talking about levels of wakefulness. In the dream state, we are still the same person, the same self, but in a different world, a dream world, in which we can move around without the real wakeful body moving anywhere at all. When we wake up, we discover we were in the bed. We might have been shaking a little bit and moving our arms or our body, but we never left the bed and went anywhere still the same location. When we open up a higher level of awareness or consciousness, it's like waking up from a dream. No difference. Somebody sent me a quotation from a famous sage of India. Quotation was simple. 
He said, the wakeful state and the dream state are the same. Dream is short, wakeful is long. But there's no difference. If that is true, the wakeful state is also a dream state from another level. Then a second wakefulness from the wakeful state would make us feel this was a dream. We thought we were gone somewhere. We are looking for something. We are traveling. We never traveled anywhere. We just went to sleep at the same spot. What would happen if this wakefulness can be multiplied and wakeful several times, not once, at least four or five times? Supposing we wake up from one state to another and keep on waking up, what will we discover? At least it's interesting to know what are the potentials, what possibilities there. I want to share with you the possibilities that can arise if we keep on waking up to different levels. When we wake up from a dream to this level, the rules of the laws of nature change. In the dream, you can be in one place, one second, another place, second, second. It looks absolutely normal. Nobody ever questioned how I was in Chicago. One minute, another minute, I am in New York, and it makes all sense, yes, I am there. The dream sequences do not allow us to question something so odd. In the wakeful state, you can't do that. The physical body, the material body is different from the dream body, and therefore, we can't move like that in a physical state. In this state, different rules are operating. Here, our sense perceptions, which give us an experience of this world, are all fixed into our body. We can't believe we can see without these eyes. The eyes are fixed in a particular position on the body. We can't hear without the ears. We can't walk without feet. We can't do things without our hands. Everything is fixed in the body. What is fixed? Sense perceptions. The ability to perceive. Nothing more. Supposing we didn't have the body, but we had to have complete sense perceptions, located spatially exactly where it is in the physical body. You get a little glimpse of it in a dream body, because dream body also can see with the eyes in the dream body, and we run around with that body. But there is no body, and we discover it was just made up. Supposing our sense perceptions which are located at a certain point. We know where the head and toes, we stand up at a certain height. And we know where the eyes are, where the ears are, where our hands are, where our feet are. Supposing we can retain this awareness and use our sense perceptions fully without a physical body, what would we feel like? You'll feel that you have the same kind of body because the whole knowledge of the universe of the, this universe is coming from the sense perceptions. You have no sense perception, the world disappears. You have sense perceptions, world comes into being. How much does it come into being? To the extent of your perception. There is no way you can have more than what your sense perceptions are giving you. So that is why if this body, material, physical body disappears and the sense perceptions remain intact exactly in the same location, as they are on this body, that's called an astral body, a body more awake than the physical. It's not a, not a different body altogether. It's the same thing, except the matter has been taken out, physical atoms have been taken out, molecules have been taken out, sense perceptions, which gave us the experience of the dream and the experience of the wakefulness are still intact. The astral body is nothing more than the continuation of sense perceptions without matter. But we function just like that. What is creating problems in the physical system are mainly the matter attached to sense perceptions. We get problems because of the heaviness of our body. We want to lose weight. We want to be active. That's for matter, not for sense perceptions. We don't need any exercise for, for just the sense perceptions. We need exercise for the material added on to it, 
therefore if you look very carefully most of our problems in this physical world have been created because to our astral self we have added so much matter and we can escape from this matter and still be ourselves that is a higher wakeful state sometimes we get that higher wakeful state suddenly by itself some people have had that experience suddenly they feel they are light everything else is light it's a new world same world but looks new or you can get it by a certain practice of meditation which means you can become unaware of the physical body by a practice of withdrawal of your attention from the body and from that what is connected to the body which means the outside experience if you can withdraw your attention from this physical body which is often called dying while living dying in the body still living if we can be alive in our total awareness of our perceptions and still have no awareness of the body we get the astral state of being it can be achieved pretty easily not very easily but it is somewhat easily compared to what else we can get as human beings as human beings our potential is very high but this is the first step that we can withdraw our attention from the physical body and just by withdrawing attention become unaware of the physical part of a body automatically the sense perceptions or the astral self wakes up and we discover that that was more real than this this was not the body that was having sense perceptions the sense perceptions had been superimposed upon a physical piece of flesh and bones which was body this discovery is very important what else do we discover we discover that when we are in the physical body we relate to our existence based upon the age of the physical body we are trained to say you were born at that time therefore now you are so many years old now you grown up so much we look back on the state of the body and say yes i am now old or i am young based on what is the age of the body we take our birth to be the time when the body was born we try to think of something that could have happened earlier no it couldn't have happened we were not even here we were here only when we were born therefore a very big constriction is placed even on our awareness of our own self by thinking that we were there at the time of birth and we will no longer be there at the time of our death we are identifying the self completely with the material physical body unfortunate that we should get this kind of constriction kind of a barrier upon our own awareness that we are physical body that's all it is and the sense perceptions arise from there there's a gray matter here a brain that's giving consciousness and that's creating all the sense perceptions yes working in the body sense perceptions work independently we know it how do we know it let us say sight vision seeing we say these eyes see but we close our eyes and imagine something else beautiful flowers here i can imagine other bouquet of flowers just by closing my eyes or even opening my eyes i can see a bunch of flowers am i really seeing no no you are not seeing you are imagining but i am imagining through what power is it vision is it seeing or something else it is seeing i can hear voices i can hear imagined voices let me see what is the connection between so called imagination and our use of sense perceptions it appears that with imagination we can use all our five sense perceptions it is amazing that what we think is unreal the definition of imagination is imaginary is unreal what is not imagined is real but the imagination can create all five sense perceptions the only means to have any experience of any level of consciousness including the dream state wakeful state and astral state 
So the sense perceptions are not connected with the physical body. You can have the same perceptions. You use them in dream, you use them in imagination. So that is why we have made a mistake in thinking that sense perceptions only come from the physical body. Now when we say you can separate your sense perceptions or your astral self from the physical body, what is the process? What we call basic meditation. Basic meditation is to figure out where are you operating these sense perceptions from. When you want to see, where do you decide I want to see? You want to touch something, where do you decide I want to touch something? You want to walk, where do you decide I want to walk here? Where do these decisions come from, from yourself? Because we are now going back to the location of the self at any time. Are we deciding where to look from our hands, from our feet, from our legs, from our arms, from our heart, from our throat? Where are we deciding from? From our head. Doesn't take very long. You just contemplate for a little while, you will know that all decisions we are taking is something connected with our th thinking process, is connected to something happening in the brain, in the mind, in the head. In, in fact, if you contemplate more, you can even know exactly, is it in the side of the brain? Is it in the center? Where do we feel? Let me give a simpler example. We have two eyes. It's a means of using perception of sight, of vision, to see. We could have had one eye. They say the cyclops, there was a race that had one eye, they had a big problem living. They couldn't know what was near, what was far. Our whole concept of distance is coming to eyes. Where is the sound coming from? To ears. If you had only one ear, you wouldn't know where the sound is coming from. These two organs of ours, these two sense perceptions of ours, to see and to hear, have been provided in duplicate so that we can create an actual experience of time and space and directions. Very interesting. Now, when you see with the two eyes, examine, do the two eyes see the same thing or different? actually different. One eye seeing from one angle, and I seeing from another angle. Two pictures falling on the retina in the eye are different, not the same. We two eyes never see the same thing. But if you combine the two, what happens when you combine the two, they make one image with distance. We create that. We create distance by using two eyes. Sometimes uh, very children come to me and I little experiment with them. See, do you have one finger or two? If you look at the finger, one. Look there, two. Anybody can try it. That when you are looking at one finger in front and looking at the distance, they become two. One finger looking more real than the other. Where are they coming from? The two fingers are the two different fingers seen by the two eyes. Everybody has one eye more predominant, and therefore one finger looks more real. When we look at the finger, the others fade out, one finger becomes real. They have these 3D movie theatres now, they give you glasses so that they, they can combine the two pictures shown on the screen, they look like one screen, creating distance and things like, things are coming to us. I once went to Disneyland or Disney World, one of these places I remember many years ago, and they were showing something, we had to wear those special glasses, and things became real. In that particular movie they showed, there was a truck carrying right rats or mice, and the truck was full of rats. And suddenly, by accident, the back door opened and all the rats came out and ran toward the audience. I'll tell you, everybody picked up their feet. <laughs> it's only on the screen. Everybody picked up their feet and they tried to avoid the rats coming to them and defend themselves. And when the rats came near, there was such a big stink. It was very simple. What they had done was, in that theater, 
not only had they two images which were being combined with the glasses, they had also put some little air pumps. So when the rats came, they put the air pumps on, looked like they're really crawling in your, air, in your feet. The sensation was exactly the same. And they had also put some stinking stuff in the chairs. It's just all coordinated. Now, now there are theatres coming up, creating virtual reality with all the sense perceptions intact. They can be created. Point I'm making is, when you see two images in the two eyes and combine into one without using any outside glasses, where do you combine them? Where do we see? When we see at a distance and see one image, eyes are seeing two, we are seeing one. At what point in our own head, in our own perception, are we combining them? We are combining them in the center of the head. At a point very close, anatomy, from the point of anatomy of the head, very close to where the pineal gland is, the pituitary body is, medulla oblongata. That's exactly if you want to know where we are combining a vision every day. What is the significance of that point? that we are able to see and combine there. When we hear with two ears, how do we determine one sound from two ears coming and combining, we know which direction is coming from, same point. Every sense perception, if you study, is being experienced by us when we are wakeful and conscious at that same point. That point, just because of the two eyes combining there, has been sometimes called third eye or single eye. Don't think it's something different, just a point where we're using sense perceptions. But it's a very significant point. Very significant because when we say, I can see that, the I is coming from that point. The self is coming from that point. That is the location of the self. That is the location of the self in the physical body, the wakeful state. Now, if we know that much, very good knowledge, very good information, then we know where to concentrate our attention to become unaware of the physical body. That's the point. Makes the technique of withdrawing of attention very easy. We close our eyes, we know we are behind the eyes. How deep? We also know. We are in the center. To make it more obvious from external signs, we are behind the eyes, between the ears, in the center. That's the point where the self is operating in a wakeful human being. Now that's very interesting that if you know where the self is operating from and you want to withdraw to yourself, what is outside of the self will gradually disappear. You become unaware of it. So that is why if we can concentrate our own attention which is now being used only to have perceptions outside, if we start withdrawing it and think of nothing outside, but only what's happening at that point. If we can imagine, if just imagine ourselves, if we imagine we are sitting there, and take an artificial imaginary form of ourselves, take any form that we are really sitting there, imaginary form, but we are in the head of this body, sitting in the center. What will happen? If we sit in the center, we're using imagination. More we think of that spot inside, the less aware we become what's happening outside. It's the nature of attention. When you concentrate attention, you become unaware of what is outside of the area of concentration. You can see it, people go to a concert, several musical instruments are playing. You like the drums. You concentrate your attention and start listening to the drums other instruments become weak. Drums become louder. Nothing is happening there, it's all happening inside. We have this power of using the concentration of attention to become not only aware, more aware of where we are concentrating, but to become unaware of what is outside of it. That's the beauty of this gift to us, the gift we have that we have the power to concentrate our attention at will, when we like. It's a very big gift given to human beings. When we use this gift to imagine we are there at the third eye center and forget everything else, just put our attention there, 
What else is happening? Is it dark there? Can we see images? Can we remember things? Can we dance there? Can we talk there? Everything confined to that area when we start almost a life there. We forget what's outside, which means we become unaware of outside things, of the body. And very strange thing is, when you become unaware of the body through that practice, it starts by your not knowing where your hands and feet are. It's very interesting because if you suddenly to say, let me see where I am, I'm just thinking only of this point. Where did I put my hands? Where are my feet? The sensation of, of perception of where your hands and feet are disappears first. If you continue, you don't know where the legs and arms are. If you continue more, you begin to float in the sky because the bottom is pulled out. Your bottom you are not aware of. You're still aware of the rest of the torso. You concentrate more, you don't even know that. Eventually, that becomes yourself. You don't even know where the body is. Now, compare this experience with a person dying of a terminal illness in a hospital. I have seen hundreds of people dying in hospitals and seen how slowly the death overtakes them. They first don't know where their hands and feet are. Then they don't know where their legs and arms are. Then they feel they are floating in air and their bottom is gone. They're still speaking to us. Then they go higher up. They can't even speak. They want to speak. Eyes can be seen, still try to move. Then the brain dead, they're dead. Do you see that the process of withdrawal of attention to your own third eye center is almost the same as physical dying? And that is why it's called dying while living. Because you're not dead. You're doing a practice of something. Your vital organs are working normal. Heart is beating normal. Breathing is normal. Everything is normal. All vital signs are normal. And yet you are not aware of where the body is gone. A wonderful method available to us to achieve a state of wakefulness, which otherwise would only come when we physically die and leave the body. Which means we can have an experience of what will be your state. What will be our state after we physically die can be tested out while we're physically alive right now. Imagine the benefits of this. Just one exercise. The benefits of waking up through an exercise to a state of being which will be the state after you die was the state before you went to sleep into the physical state. What happens to the mind? The mind that is thinking all the time, what happened to the mind? Mind is still as thinking as strongly as now. Mind does not change with this exercise. One thing happens. Our constriction that we cannot imagine anything of ourselves before we were born, because we link it with our physical body, disappears. We can remember we were there before we were born. Because that state of being was not created with the body. The body was created from that state. Therefore, so far as memory is concerned, in the same brain, same mind we are having, having the physical body, the memory removes that barrier and can move back and remember where you were before you were born and can see where you will be after you die. For people who are how curious about past lives and so on, why go to some special people who say you were Antony and Cleopatra and all that? Find out for yourself. They make nice stories to make you feel good. I don't know how many Cleopatras I've met, how many, <laughs> when they tell me of their past life regressions and so on. No, find out yourselves. By withdrawal of attention to a state where you existed. How long did you exist in that state? We can't remember everything. Even this physical body, we can't remember everything. We can remember something. We can remember our childhood. We can remember some events of earlier. But in that state, also, we can remember some things. But we can remember things happened 200 years ago, 400 years ago. Some people remember 1,000 years ago. That, and then we know that we will be in this state when the body is dropped off. So we get so much information and so many. I see thousands of people are curious about this thing. 
but they satisfy their curiosity by reading books, by going to lectures like uh, this one, <laughs> by going to see outside. The answers are all inside. The answers are in the experience inside, not outside. And the whole method of getting the answers so convincingly, because it's your own experience, is just by meditating up to the point of wakeful to the next stage. By the way, we sometimes say we are on a spiritual journey. What I'm describing is not a spiritual journey. This is just a wakeful state. Another level. We go to sleep and we wake up. We don't say spiritual awakening. Every, every morning we wake up, we don't call it spiritual. How can we call another awakening also spiritual? Nothing to do with the spirit. What is spirit? When we say spiritual, we are talking of spirit. What is spirit? Spirit is soul. Spirit is life. We are not talking of life here at all. We are talking of an experience of life. One experience, another experience, different levels of wakefulness, nothing spiritual. When does the spiritual experience start? The spiritual experience starts when you know you are the spirit, you are the soul. These experiences which I'm talking of don't give you any knowledge at all. That don't give you any information to the spirit. What would happen if we could wake up more than the astral stage of wakefulness where sense perceptions are intact. Our life in that form has been much longer than the life here. Most people can discover average life, 1,000 to 3,000 of physical years has been our life in that state. We were born there also. We will die there also. But the time available physically, physical measurement is much larger. What would happen if we woke up from that state? It's a little bit premature for me to say that because it would be better if I were to tell you that at the astral stage. But just for information, FYI, <laughs> only for information I tell you that if you were to meditate in the astral stage, because meditation is equally possible there, we meditate with sense perceptions. We meditate where we believe we have a Head and we have a third eye center inside because we have eyes. We have eyes like this in the astral self also. We have completely, we complete our whole self in a new form, but the form is similar. So we still can concentrate our attention at the third eye center of our astral self. Very few people do it, unfortunately. When people tell me of their meditational experiences, I find they want to get all the experiences from this state of meditation, from the physical body. In the physical body, we want to see what the astral is, what the higher is. You can't go higher when you're locked up here. You can have a glimpse of the next level. Sometimes you might have a glimpse accidentally of a still higher level, but that is not a willful wakefulness into higher level like it's possible level one. If you meditate in level one, in the astral self, same way like you do in the physical self, except you're not then connected with this body at all. The imaginary body through which you became total sense perceptions, sit in that body and put your attention, third eye center of that body, you'll wake up to higher level. That is an experience almost indescribable, but I will describe it, <laughs> which is, of course, a very strange, strange claim I'm making. But I, I can make the claim because every description I'm going to give, or so many enlightened people have given, and I'm just copying them, the descriptions have been given so that we can relate it to our physical experiences. There's so many things you cannot be described at all because they're not like anything that we experience here. But to just to understand and to differentiate between different experiences, we use analogies. We just use similes analogies compared to what we can see here. What happens when we awake by concentration of attention on the third eye center of an astral body? we forget the astral body, become unaware of it, 
and open out to a self and we discover the self is thinking. Thinking in language, all languages, thinking in several languages which were never learned, thinking in, in images, all kinds of images, thinking in memories, producing memories, generating memories, packing them up in order to make destinies of our lower levels of sleep or wakefulness. The biggest experience anybody has had and very few people have had that. I, I have met people in India, some yogis sitting up in the mountains who described similar terms that they discovered that what we call mind here as a thinking mechanism in our brain was actually the state of wakefulness beyond the astral. The mind is a body also. It looks like it's something different, just a function of the brain function that we're thinking. Thinking itself is arising from a state of being. And the ability to perceive which had been divided into hearing separate, seeing separate, touching separate, is all combined into one. Perception is total. Now see how it's difficult to describe it here because we are so used to these perceptions being separate. Right now, physiologically, by our anatomy of the body, they describe how these sense organs of ours, they connect to the brain in different parts of the brain and then that part of the brain where the nerves uh, end up, for example, the optic nerve, behind the retina is the optic nerve. It goes as a nerve and goes into the area of the optic. And there, it is there that we really see. The actual imagery is made there. Hearing, we go from the ears, go to the oral nerves, but they go to the place where the brain sees for example, I got some hearing aids. So now when I talk, when you talk to me personally, I can hear you. Previously, I was just imagining what you were saying. <laughs> At fashion today. But the point was, can the ears by themselves distinguish between noise and speech? No. Ear, ear drums have no capacity to do that. Ear drums are merely receiving sound waves and moving the sound waves and creating sound. How do you separate sound into noise and speech? We don't want to hear noise, we want to hear speech. The brain does it, not the ears. Where does it happen? In the oral center, in the brain. They have discovered 300 cases today where those nerves have been misplaced in the brains of children and they can see with the ears and hear with their eyes. Very great difficulty for them to live here, but that's what the nerves are misconnected. 300 cases have been found like that, but at the second level of wakefulness to what we call the causal state of being, from astral we go to causal state of being, all perceptions are getting combined in one place and you can touch, say, see, hear, everything, one go. That cannot be described here, but can be experienced just by the state of wakefulness. It's great because you discover so much about yourself that there is a thinking machine that is creating everything that's being created. And then if you go in that vastness of space that is created, here we have a space. When we go to sleep and have a dream, we create a space. That's where we run around. That space is created in the dream. It's a dream space. It's not as big when we wake up. This looks bigger space. Maybe you could make the dream space as big as you like if you had strong imagination in the dream. You don't have it that strong. When you wake up, the space is much bigger. When you go to the astral self, the space is even bigger. You go to causal self, you are the creator of space at time. So it's very great experience. 
to solve all these riddles that people have been trying to examine. Scientists are doing it, metaphysicians are doing it, yogis are doing it. Everybody is trying to find out. And you find, if you go to the higher part of the space, like we can travel here in space, we can travel, we can fly in other regions also. If you fly to the higher level of the causal plane, where the mind alone is the body, you discover we are all participating only in one mind. It looks different because we, if we go to sleep and dream, we see 20 people in the dream, when we wake up, all 20 came from us. We see 100 people in a dream and we talk to them, they are different from us, they look different and we wake up, they are all created by us, by one single dreamer. One single dreamer can create as many as you like. There we discover we are actually all created. And all minds are created from one mind. They will participating in one universe. People think the universal mind at that level is the creative power for everything. I have to admit it is. Everything we are seeing in the physical world, the dream world, the higher wakeful world, the astral world, the causal world, is all being generated from one universal mind. And therefore, people have called that their true home. It's the origin. If the origin of all experiences is to be found, there we found it. Only two levels of meditative experience. And we can find the origin of everything. So many saints even, I had a chance to meet many, have called that our true home. Because that's the origin of everything, creator of everything, the ultimate creator. The ultimate creator is the causal plane, the chief, the head, the ultimate top of the creative plane. And yet I tell you, based on what this man, whose picture you see behind me, Baba Sawan Singh, my master, told me, none of this is spiritual. This whole journey, whole experience is not spiritual. When did the soul come in? All we are talking of is mind. Meditation with the mind. Withdrawing attention with your effort, mind. It's the mind deciding everything. The mind is discovering itself. Where is the soul coming in? What is soul then? If this is the whole reality, and so many people believe that this mind that is functioning is the soul, that because we are thinking, it's the soul thinking, which is not true at all. Let us see the distinction between the soul and the mind. The soul is the spirit. The soul is what makes our journey spiritual, not the mind. These are all mental activities I've described so far. As mental as designing a mental program outside, designing a software out here, designing a new engineering skill, you are using discovering something new here and inventing something new here. All mental activity, discovering your mind is also mental activity. Nothing spiritual. If we are on a spiritual path and are doing what I've just said, are we wasting our time? Some people say, yes, you are. A lot of people are wasting their time. I wasted several years trying this very thing. So if it's a waste of time, where is the reality then? We want to be on a spiritual path and not on a mental path. And all that meditation is giving us some wonderful mental results, showing us how long have we have been here before we were born, after we died, there's a real identity we have, answering all the heavens existing. We were in heaven, we were in hell, all are existing. All of them can be accessed in the astral self. They all are the astral level. Everything created. Their beings exist as we know them, with sense perceptions, who can look at us, talk to us, are lying at the astral self or the physical self. The universal mind is a very great realization how powerful a mind is, a universal mind in which all minds participate, how powerful it is to be the creative force of the entire three universes. Where is the spirituality then? We know the spirituality right here. We just don't care for it. I think we don't distinguish it from the mind.
let me tell you some characteristics of the mind and the soul so we make no mistake. What is mind, what is soul? Soul is life. No soul, no life. Whether it's physical, astral, dream, causal, no life. Soul is life. Soul makes us conscious. Soul makes us aware. Soul makes us the ability to have experience. Without soul, nothing can happen. Without soul, mind does not exist. Without soul, astral body doesn't exist. Without soul, physical body doesn't exist. Without soul, nothing exists. Now that's a big thing, a big definition of soul. Mind, mind only works if the soul has yielded its power, made it arrive, and allowed it to create space and time. After space and time is created with the power of the soul that makes mind alive, the mind lives only in space and time. Its main function, thinking. It thinks all the time. If it doesn't think, it will die. Therefore, it's like it's it's like a pulse, we want to read the heartbeat, heartbeat of the mind is thinking. It thinks all the time. Never stops thinking. Thinking is its main function. But in the thinking, to connect the events of space and time through a process called cause and effect, the very basic principle on which our lives are based now, our experiences are based now, cause and effect, law of karma, the mind functions through that law, through thinking. The soul doesn't think. If soul wants to think, it is the mind. It's got an instrument to think. Why should it think? It's life-giving force. It gives life to the mind, can think through the mind. Soul doesn't have to think, never thinks. Mind speaks. Thoughts are mostly in words and images. That speech whether it's spoken in the tongue outside or spoken in the head, it's speech. Only mind speaks, soul never speaks. Soul listens. Because when somebody speaks, somebody has to listen. The mind speaks, the soul listens. All the time. See, this happening all the time to us. But I'm just trying to distinguish the two things. Mind speaks, soul listens. Soul does not function in time and space. Mind functions only in time and space. Big distinction. When we think, we are using a mind. When we know something without thinking, using the soul. If you are getting a hunch, an intuitive feeling, an intuitive knowing of anything, without thinking, soul is functioning directly giving you awareness of something without time and space. Even the smallest thought takes time. Intuitive awareness never takes time. It comes suddenly, you know something. I know it. How do you know it? I don't know how I know it. Most people say that. That's intuition. Intuition comes from the soul. Thinking comes from the mind. And we are using a combination of these two every day but you don't distinguish it. We give great predominance in our awareness to thinking and to the mind. The mind has the capacity to think so much, it virtually wipes out the intuitive experiences we are having at the same time. Intuitively we are knowing things and thinking is destroying it. If we can control thinking, he can use intuitive, intuitive self much better. How can we control the mind? If you look at how the mind, which is a thinking machine, thinking machine is functioning in us, it is making us do things. Mind decides things for us. Thoughts dictate our life. Mind says, oh, this is right, you should do like this. They say, oh, you shouldn't have done it, I'm sorry. I regret it next day. I didn't know about something else. Mind works on very limited data. What is in front of it? Intuition works on the entire collected information stored inside us. 
very different function. If you look back at your life, you'll see how the intuitive awareness was always correct, the mental aware was not. It's amazing that these two are there and we are following that which is not so accurate, not so good. We have been overwhelmed by a wonderful instrument given to us, a wonderful computer, the best that can ever be invented. It's called the mind, and we don't know how to use it. And the mind is using us. People tell me, artificial intelligence, AI, is going to be developed to the extent it will have more knowledge, more intelligence than any human being, and it will tell all human beings what to do. It will become our master. And I laughed. I said, that's already happening. There's already an AI huge powerful AI called our mind. It's controlling our lives already. It's not going to happen, it's happening. How do you reverse this? How do you get control of the mind? Simple. Don't listen to it. <laughs> what could be simpler than that? Mind says, do this, sorry, no. <laughs> not all the time. Sometimes advice can be good. Maybe three or four times a week. If you can do it daily, wonderful. I am telling you, I have seen success with people who have said no to the mind even three or four times a week when the mind wants to do something very badly, say no. Mind says, just one time, no. <laughs> Never again, no. When you say no to the mind, the word no is also being spoken by the mind. But who has ordered that the mind wants to do something, you can still say no. Who is that who is able to use the mind to say no to itself? The soul. The self. The self can become very strong by little practice of this kind. as important practice. To assert the soul in your life, you have to follow that. If you do that again and again, the mind says it's no, not worthwhile fighting with this guy. Let me do what he says. And becomes exactly our servant, an instrument for use, which is intended to be. Right now, it's exactly the opposite. The mind is our master and we are its slaves. The mind is supposed to be our slave. Then you will be able to think through the mind what you want to think. Every day you can decide, I want to think this thing. The mind will only think that. You get control. Once you get control over the mind, it makes a very big difference. Spiritual life becomes different. When people live intuitively, when they have control over their mind, you can't stop the mind from functioning. You just have control to see what you want to think. OK, think like that. Supposing the mind out of habit starts still thinking something, because it doesn't listen to you, then be very wise and ignore what it says. You can control the mind two ways, by telling the mind what to think and ignoring what it is saying if it doesn't listen to you. Both work. When we are given initiation by masters, mantras by enlightened people, they say, repeat these words. What is it for? <coughs> Repeat these words. Why do we repeat those words? It's only to make the mind repeat words it doesn't want to repeat. It's only to take some control over it. Mantra is only used for that. Just to prevent the mind from thinking other things. No, you do this. We are somehow asserting ourselves for the mind to do something that it doesn't want to do. So that's the whole purpose of repetition of words. That we force the mind to do something. We can force the mind to do any thought that we like, that we are in control. If you can you control over the mind, your life will begin to re recognize how many intuitive hunches, gut feelings you're getting every day. They're now being hidden because of our total occupation with the thinking of the mind. When you discover that, intuitively something else happens. Intuition is only one part of the function of the soul. The second part is even more wonderful. It's called love. Love comes from the soul, not from the mind. There is no way 
that you can create love by thinking. When love comes, it just comes. You fall in love. You feel it instantly, without time. Then you use the mind to think about it. That's different. But the actual experience of love is without time. It's come from the soul. It's a spiritual experience. But let us not mistake that spiritual experience of love which we all have experienced at some point or the other. Because that's natural to us. It's part of the soul. We all have soul to be alive. And love is part of the natural self. But what happens is that we try to make a copy of it by using the face of the mind, the front portion of the mind called ego, I-ness. I want to love. I want to love these flowers. I want to love you. I want to... Who are you loving? I love you. I love him. I Watch these statements. Put them all together. The only common factor is I, the ego. Those are ego games we play. Because when love comes, we forget the I. True love is the only occasion I have seen in human life when we can't think of ourselves, the beloved takes that space of the I. And that is why love is the secret of the soul and love is the secret of the spiritual path. Not meditation. Love is the secret. Love and devotion is what is called the spiritual path. Why two words? Why not only love? What is love and devotion? Love is experienced by us. True love hits us. And how we react to it is called devotion. We become devoted from the experience of love. And since both happen to us, the experience of love and our reaction to it, therefore we call it love and devotion. Love and devotion is a secret of the spiritual path. It does not involve the mind. If somebody comes to a master and gets so affected by the master because of his love, and I've seen people affected by great master, they felt something so suddenly, without time. Some cried instantly. Some fell to, their feet, to the feet of the master without thinking about it. That happens. Do they need to meditate? The love will pull them to the spiritual realms which are beyond the mind. When we want to talk of a spiritual journey, the spiritual awaken awakening takes place when we leave the mind behind and can awaken to the level of our soul. And that's possible. But my experience shows that won't happen till you experience the love from somebody who is already beyond that level. Because love that we call between human beings is very often attachment. These attachments are being called love. In attachment, we are conscious of two. In love, we are conscious of the beloved. So that is why when we come across a perfect living master, the definition of perfect living master is he is perfect because the imperfections are only in the mind. He has risen above that. Living, the living person. We can only associate with living persons. Otherwise, we only associate with our mind. A dead person, when we talk to a dead person, we are talking to our mind. Then we are talking to a non-human being, a bird, a river, a sky, nature. We are talking to our mind all the time. It's all conversation with our mind. When we talk to ascended master sitting in the Himalayas, we are talking to our mind. I have been to the Himalayas. They have never had any contact with the people who say they are in contact with the ascended masters. All this is within the mind. But when a human being, who while he is human, just like us, has the awareness opened of all levels of wakefulness, while he is in one state of physical being, its awareness is open to all levels, including the spiritual level, beyond the mind, such a person's love is pure love, hits us, and our reaction is devotion, and that's the way to go beyond the mind.